There's over 1,500 species of bamboo, but giant timber bamboo does something pretty amazing. In the first year you water bamboo, nothing happens. In the second year you water it, nothing happens. In the third year you water it, nothing happens. But in the fourth year, 90 feet in 60 days. Don't you want that kind of growth? And everybody wants that kind of growth. I understand that. We want it for ourselves, for our organizations. I get that. But what are you working on today that you won't see any results from? You know, four, five, six years out. What are you working on today that you won't see any of the results from? And what's interesting about this idea of being that patient watering, what will people say while you're over there? You're over there watering it. What will they say? What are you doing? You crazy? There are always people will doubt you and all that stuff will happen, right? That, that stuff happens all the time. But when I study successful organizations, successful people, they water anyway. <laughs> you know, one of the bamboo rules is mind your own bamboo. <laughs> also, notice your yeah buts. If you walked in the room with any resistance at all, it's probably exactly where you need to be. Resistance is critical to growth. You've got to have resistance to grow. I don't know where your resistance might be, but that might be a place to look. I have a weight bench in my basement, but I absolutely hate to lift weights. Say, Greg, why do you hate to lift weights? Greg, why do you hate to lift weights? They're heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Lifting weights, what does it do to the muscle? It strains it, and it hurts it, and it does all kinds of things to it. But with the day of rest, it comes back stronger. So whatever you resist is probably where you need to go for growth. Okay. Roger Bannister. What's so big about Roger Bannister? First recorded four minute mile, Roger Bannister. Did anybody know what year he did that? 1954, he broke the four minute mile in 1954. <laughs> Page six, yes. <laughs> I was a quiz, see if you guys are reading the book. Uh, but he, Roger Bannister breaks the four minute mile in 1954. For me, that's a cool feat. But what's really interesting about this whole thing of the four minute mile, people's obsession with it. The Greeks had lions and tigers chasing people to see if they could break a four minute mile. <laughs> Looks like he didn't make it. <laughs> I mean, with a lion after you, wouldn't you run about a three minute mile? I mean, give me a break. <laughs> that's just cruel. And what's interesting about it is, what did all the science and all the research say about a person breaking a four minute mile? can't be done, it's impossible. So all this research that could fill this entire theater says you can't break a four minute mile. What do you think Roger was doing when he was training? I guess I'm not gonna make it, <laughs> but I'll try it anyway. What do you think he was saying? What was his language like? He had a positive, he had a positive vision about it, he had the right language about it, he practiced as if he could, he took those actions that made it true. All change happens that way. All change happens that way. That's why you look for a 44-point play. It starts with the vision of that. But part of this is very humble beginnings. I lived with my grandfather as a child. My grandfather uh, was an amazing man. He died in 96, but believe me, he's in the room today. If I say anything that you think worthy of repeating, all right, it probably came from him. My grandfather was an amazing. He was Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato all in one. And living with him, he imparted some really important wisdom to me. So I want to just sort of acknowledge that just right off, the, right off the bat. He was a farmer. He had his uh, farm, and he would farm all day, you know, sun up to sun down. And my job as a child was to run water out to him, but he always had a big smile on his face. Now, now keep in mind, he's got one plow and one mule plowing row after row after row. Uh, a lot of us uh, came from, uh, from the farm. If you sort of think about your life, you, you're either your grandparents or their parents, we're all sort of farmers, right? What came after the agricultural age, though? Industrial age. What came after that? Information age. What age are we in now? Global age. <laughs> Old age. <laughs> <laughs> we are now in the relationship age. Individuals and organizations that understand this will thrive. It's really about your relationships. How do we build relationships as leaders? How do we build relationships in our community? How do we build relationships globally? What does a really skilled pool player do after every single shot? They chalk the cue. What's that? They think about the next 
think about the next one. Where do they chalk the cue and think about the next one? Do they do it at the table or away from the table? They step back. Step back. All of you, step back a little bit. Right now you're on a little retreat, okay? Just step back a little bit from the business of your life. Step back and take a retreat so you can gain perspective. That's really what this is about. How do I step back from the business of life to gain perspective? Kansas. Kansas was a number one rated team uh, in college basketball. They beat them in the NCAA tournament. Bucknell beat them. It's really not that big a deal, but the interview with Coach Flannery after the game was amazing. I watched it and I about fell out of my chair. This is what he said. This is, they said the, inter the interviewer asked him, say, Coach, how did you get your players convinced that they could beat Kansas? Well, it was simple. I told my players, we can't beat Kansas. He says, they got all Americans. They're taller, they're faster, they jump higher. They're the number one team in the country. James Naismith, who invented the game of basketball, coached at Kansas. There is no way we can beat Kansas and its historic history. There's no way we can do it. He says, in fact, I think they got better coaching. Isn't this motivating? <laughs> he says, but we can play with Kansas for three minutes. And if we play with Kansas for three minutes, there'll be a commercial break. We can play with for three more minutes, and there will be a commercial break. And then we'll play them for three more minutes. Have you ever watched the NCAA tournament game? There's a lot of commercials. <laughs> and in our life, you can do whatever you wrote down for three minutes. But believe you me, there will be a commercial break. I can listen for three minutes, commercial break. See, life's one three minutes at a time. It's one that way. Break it down, three minutes at a time. Does worry work? Anybody? Does worry work? If it did, there wouldn't be a recession. There wouldn't be any problems. There wouldn't be world hunger. There wouldn't be any problems at all. Worry doesn't work. Action works. The pessimists are winning. I was working with the CEO just recently, and, and I did, did a work project with his company for two to three years. And he just says, I can't believe the cynicism. And I'm thinking, well, I've been working with your group. <laughs> it should change by now. He goes, no, no, no. He says, generally around society. There's so much cynicism. I mean, it, it, it's so interesting to me. If, you, if I went up to you in a coffee shop somewhere, anywhere, Atlanta, here, Portland, any, anywhere uh, I was, and I walked up to you and say, gosh, you know, it's pretty tough out there in the economy. You'd, you'd probably have something to add to it. But if I walked up to you and said, what are your hopes and your dreams for your future, your family, your kids? You'd look at me like I was strange. <laughs> Isn't that odd? I ask about your hopes and your dreams, and it seems kind of weird. But I take you down a negative path, and we bond. Leaders right now must have more appreciative conversations. You have to have them with yourself and the people around you. Here's one way to do that. Ask yourself, what's going well? What's going well? Name three things that are going well for you right now. Adam Vinatieri, uh, in studying uh, this notion of deliberate practice, I studied Adam Vinatieri. Do you know how he practices field goals? Let me describe to you this. He pipes in crowd noise louder than any stadium. He actually takes, he never takes a practice kick in a casual way. He actually films every single kick and he studies every single kick. He puts himself under so much pressure in practice that the game is no big deal. That's deliberate practice. So what, how can you use that analogy in your world? I mean, maybe it's a negotiation you have to do. Maybe it's your writing. Whatever it might be, practice it deliberately. Look at what you're doing. That's what great people do. They get better over time. They get better, and they improve, and they improve, and they improve. What do you need to deliberately practice? <laughs>